Okay, hello. Uh, thank you, Andre, for the pressure. Um, I'm looking forward to try to keep up a little bit with what I've shown, but it's definitely not going to be as cool as that. Um, I am uh, Stefana. Just like Andre, I work at ETH Zurich. I'm doing my research with grammatical research. Um, basically, to put it in a nutshell, how to work with uh, a number of robots, I work with multiple robots to uh, build up complex structures. Um, grammatical research is an institution at ETH that's been there for 10 years, over 10 years, and the main uh, focus of the research is how to employ industrial robots in architectural construction processes. And the reason why we look into this is uh, basically not to automate processes that already exist that are done by humans, but to look into what can robots do that humans cannot do. So one big advantage is that a robot can uh, position, it can move, and it can hold elements precisely in three-dimensional space, which is extremely difficult for a human to uh, measure and hold and put it in the exact position. Um, more than that, if we employ more than just one robot, we can uh, we can uh, actually get to implement tasks that are a lot more complex that cannot be done with one machine, uh, such as we have a project on spatial wire cutting using two robots or using master-slave principles where two robots together uh, wind an element. So I'm going to show you two projects that have been developed uh, at EDH um, where two robots are working together uh, fabricating structures, trying to get into uh, complex, bespoke, differentiated structures to open up the possibilities for architecture. Um, both of these projects were done using our robotic fabrication laboratory. This is an, uh, a facility that has been opened in 2016. We have four uh, industrial robots that are hanging from a three-axis gantry system, so we can basically reach any point in space uh, in this hole within a volume of uh, 45 by 70 meters. Uh, this gives us a lot of freedom. The fact that they're hanging is also a huge advantage that we have the open floor plan and we can really build large scale objects. So the first project I'd like to go into is the Brick Labyrinth. We are not just a research institution, we do a lot of teaching of course as a university. So this is a student's project. This gives the students the opportunity to really go hands-on and use those machines and exploit their potential and get in touch with them as early as possible in their education. So uh, this was developed during the MAS program that we tutor actually collaboratively with DBT, so with Andre here. Um, and the purpose was to go into a process which has been for grammatical research, it's almost an archaic process. This is the first thing that they've developed 10 years ago, bricklaying, robotic bricklaying. Um, what we um, tried to uh, achieve in comparison to the many projects that have been done before is a completely reversible, recyclable um, construction system. So basically what we've been doing until now is use mortar or glue between the stones. And this was the first project where we used pure dry stacking so we could build up these 12,000 uh, bricks over there and then within three weeks and then within two days build it back completely, get the bricks stacked uh, again as uh, we started with and uh, basically not notice anything of the process. Um, this came, however, with a lot of challenges. So our students uh, were um, quite uh, challenged to come up with a process that uh, ensures stability, that makes it a safe uh, prototype structure, so they had to do a lot of analog testing. We developed digital processes in general, a lot of focus on digital and robotic fabrication, but none of them come without any really analog hands-on testing uh, to get the experience of the material and what's actually happening there. Um, and now I would uh, show you a quick video which showcases the whole process. So basically we start up with stacks of standardized bricks um, the design is fully uh, digital, computational, so we have a digital model with every single brick inside of there. We define uh, sequencing so such that the robot can reach everywhere. Um, and then within a custom programmed um, communication interface with the robotic controller, we can actually send uh, parts of the fabrication directly to the robot controller 
online, so we can, we can send the part, fabricate it, see what's happening over there, get feedback from it, adjust it, react to it, and keep building to it. Um, this was mostly done uh, by the students themselves, so we provide them with the tools, um, but they get within a few weeks to learn how to use them and how to interact with it. We developed, again, a custom pretty, let's say, uh, basic rudimentary tool, but we're, in order to speed up the process, we could pick up eight bricks at the same time, it's a magazine, and then drive into position and uh, put them on the spot one after the other. Um, since I was talking about multiple robots, in this case we used two of the big robots on the gantry um, to parallelize the process, so it's literally about speed and reach. We got the process obviously two times <laughs> as fast as using one of them. Um, it came with some constraints and difficulties, of course. The robots shouldn't get into each other's way. You have to deal with the sequencing. How can they reach everywhere? Um, but it sped up the process a lot. And parallel to the big robots, we employed some pretty small-scale robots, UR5 robots, to build up these brick stacks such that while the big robots are placing the bricks, the little ones uh, prepare the next stack. This is a easy, repeatable job for them um, and just uh, have everything ready to go for the next one. So we have a pretty clear task division between the different types of robots which uh, works well with this process. Um, once this is done, they're being picked up by the two robots simultaneously um, and then positioned into place. I think there's some more views on how the positioning is happening. Um, a lot of thought went into um, the geometry itself of the uh, structure, the stability, so we wrote our own simulations. They're, again, quite basic geometric simulations, but enough to be able to tell that the structure is going to be stable. Um, the sequencing on how to go from one side to the other, making sure that it is again stable, um, and then we can build it up. This was in the end built up uh, during three weeks, um, normal production time, and then again, as mentioned, reverse took down, taking down in two days and getting back to it. Okay, so I'm going to move. Well, what? These are some impressions of the labyrinth. Um, we had leaning walls, cantilevering walls, which luckily, since we uh, simulated them, let's say quite accurately, they were standing and did not fall on our heads. And this was the final result of the labyrinth with uh, 2 meters 80 tall. Um, and yeah, everyone could experience it in our lab. Um, moving forward to my next project, this is part of my PhD thesis. Um, and Basically, moving on from employing robots parallelly to speed up processes or to gain a uh, bigger reach, this project looks really into robots working together, so collaborating. What can we achieve by employing more than one robot to do tasks together? It's based on a pretty simple process of uh, alternative assembly. So one robot brings one element, then the second robot brings the second element. Once the connection between those two elements is done, the first robot can let go again and bring a new element, and this process is repeated over time until a stable configuration is reached. Um, what this gives us is the, um, the opportunity of building very complex geometric structures while one robot is constantly holding on to the structure. So it provides support, it provides a scaffold, uh, it makes sure that the, uh, it doesn't, the structure doesn't get deformed or distorted, so it also decreases tolerances in the structure, and we can build extremely complex geometries with completely bespoke parts. Nothing has to be standardized. Not a single bar is the same length as the other, and the position in space is completely free. Um, this does not only come with challenges in the fabrication process, but of course these uh, digital fabrication uh, processes give back information on what can we actually design. So a big question is what sort of geometries can we build with it? How's the structural behavior of it? Uh, the structure I'm going to show is based on a tetrahedral logic. This was supposed to be an animation, but I guess let's try one more time. But you can probably read out the tetrahedral. So it's built up of 
um, stable components. We're just going to move on. Ah, oh, there we go. Um, to ensure the stability of this structure. Furthermore, uh, we put a lot of work in the connection. So this robotic fabrication process is not dependent on any prefabricated connectors that need to be standard, that need to be um, uh, produced, uh, customized, and uh, come with quite a high uh, logistical effort. The, the fact that we, we split up the node, we um, developed it from a node where all bars come into a point to a node where just, one, just two bars touch in one single point. And this enables it to be uh, implemented in a robotic fabrication process very easily because it does not require any additional parts or anything to be prefabricated. This comes with a bunch of uh, geometric constraints. So we have uh, multiple connection points that have to fit. This means you cannot build any geometry out there. You can build a huge range of geometries, but you need to be aware and you need to feed back the limitations and the constraints that come from these systems in your digital model. But what this allows you to do is control these sort of very, very complex nodes, which seem pretty random, uh, but they are fully mathematically calculated and controlled and can be, um, can be built up with the robot. Uh, in addition, structure is a big uh, topic. So structures that are this um, irregular and unpredictable, we run structural analysis, we integrate the analysis process in the design process to be able to understand what's happening in there and to be able to feed this back to the design process. Because again, we cannot just take intuitive uh, decisions on what change will uh, improve the behavior. Um, on the material side and fabrication, uh, we use steel rods. They are manually welded for now. Welding is a process that is easily uh, automatable. We did not focus on this. This is something that the industry does a lot better than we do, but we hope and we know that this will uh, be possible in the future. Um, we end up with these sort of nodes where the, you see the geometric complexity, but still the connection. It's always two bars that come together. They are manually welded and the structure is fixed. One big challenge, the two robots working in the common workspace, uh, they can get into each other's way, of course. The collisions, collisions with the built structures. It's a very complex environment. Uh, we implemented algorithms. This is, again, probably needs a bit of time to load. But we implemented algorithms to calculate the path required for one robot to place one bar uh, without colliding with the existing structure or with the robot that's already there. I'm trying to go back and forth. Maybe it loads again. OK. We'll give it one more try otherwise. This is the coolest part of it, so I'd be really sad if this is not visible. <laughs> there we go. So you see the robots really driving into very intricate positions um, without colliding and with taking into account everything that's needed to position the bars in these uh, tricky positions out there. So. And with this process, we uh, managed to build up several prototypes. I'm showing one of them, uh, which was 4 meters 60 tall. It uh, consisted of 72 bars. We built it within three days. We must say this is a prototypical process, so we run the robots pretty slow. We are super duper scared. We try not to run into problems. So uh, those three days are still a very, very slow process, but uh, I'm very confident that this can be sped up. Uh, as soon as processes are robust enough. And yeah, what uh, I'd like to go into is basically what, is, what do these uh, developments mean for the design process of architects? So as Andre mentioned, this step from the digital uh, design environment where you can basically draw up, visualize anything you like nowadays, then to the physical built environment where you can almost build anything you like, I like to reconnect everything again back to the digital environment because you need to feed back all this information somehow digitally to be able to design these structures such that they are feasible, that they are fabricatable, that they are structurally consistent. So a big question is how to put all these uh, constraints together, geometric constraints, structural constraints, fabrication constraints into one process. This is what we're currently researching on. 
Uh, one uh, proposal of mine is to split it up into different tasks and employ different computational methods to be able to deal with the different types of variables, different constraints. I will not go into details into all of this, um, but I think it's a big topic that still needs uh, a lot of attention, not just how to build everything, but how to design all of these complex structures. And I'd like to wrap up with a short trailer video of the NCCR Digital Fabrication, which is a pro program that funds uh, both our research projects and a bunch more. These, these were the first four years, and you'll see a bunch of projects that were developed there. Thank you very much.